Freedom Life Church Online. What's going on? We're excited to have you join us here today. I want to cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. One thing I want you to know about is our chat box. We have hosts that are standing by ready to get to know you. You can take notes and email them to yourself afterwards. Follow along with our Bible, any scriptures that are used. We got live prayer that you can go into a private room and speak with someone privately about any needs that are upon your heart. Our desire is that you feel like the Freedom Life family because that's exactly who you are. So right now, without any further ado, we're excited to see what God has planned today. Together before worship, Father, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. Lord, we are just living right here in your presence. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is anybody grateful to be in God's house one more time? Can I hear the grateful people make some noise? Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout yeah. unto God. Come on, let me hear you say it. with the voice of triumph. Yeah. Oh, 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 with the voice of triumph. Yeah. Oh, 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 you are the everlasting God. Shine your light through us for all the world to see. Yeah. You are the hope of broken hearts. You overcame the grave to save humanity. Sing it. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Come on. Oh, clap your hands. Come on. 
Do you believe that this morning? It's resurrection power. Oh, oh, oh. and I'm alive. I'm alive in you. Yes, Lord. It's red. Can we sing that together? Sing. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, let's raise it. You're alive. You're alive in me. Father, we thank you for your power today. It's resurrection power. Yeah. So I want to take a moment to share with you why I felt so led to, to, to sing that part over and over again. I know it's a little different than how we normally do it, but I feel like if you look at what's trending in culture right now, it just seems like suicide is at an all-time high. People who have the most, people who seem like they would have the most to live for are choosing to abandon life. And I want to let you know today that that's not God's best for you. God has such an enormous and such a beautiful and awesome plan for your life if you just reach out and receive it. In John 10, 10, he says it like this. This is Jesus talking here. He says, uh, do we have, it says, the thief comes only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I come that you might have life and enjoy that life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. How many of you want to experience life until it overflows? I know your day may seem dark. You might be depressed. You might feel like you're in this by yourself. But can I let you know you have a church that is here for you. You have pastors that will pray for you. We've got life groups. you got an entire community of believers. So you don't ever have to feel like you're in this thing by yourself. Can we just take a moment and receive the, the Zoe life that Jesus has promised us? I feel like it's not a coincidence that we just spent six weeks talking about Zoe life. And now we're going into a series talking about choosing joy. I feel like that was an assignment given to our church from God because of the calculated attack of the enemy on our culture. So, oh, come on, you say it. You're alive. Come on, lift your hands and receive that life today. Oh, and I declare that I'm alive. Come on, receive that life today. One more time. Oh, oh. Father, you're alive. So, Father, we lift our hands in this place. And we believe that you are with us, Father. For when you walk into the room, everything changes. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist. So, Father, we receive the life that you have given us. We receive it now. When you walk in 
starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet. Come on, sing. Oh, Jesus, because we're here for you, Jesus. from our hearts. Sing, we love you. Come on, sing it straight to the Father today. Father, 
Father, we really mean it. We love, we love. Father, we can't get enough of your presence. All this is for So let's just, uh, let's take a moment to invite him to really have it all, uh, to really have just that last 10%, the 10% that we are still kind of navigating through, the 10% we're kind of hoping the people next to us don't discover or realize, the 10% that we're hoping that doesn't get tampered with today. Can we just give it all to him? Can we just say you get all access this morning in the moments we share? I'm going to pray for us. And if that's your prayer, I invite you to join me. Let's pray. Lord, right now. We pray that this would be more than a song, it would be more than an anthem, but it would be a declaration, God, that when we say you can have it all, Lord, we just surrender that last bit, that bit that we hang on to in moments where you're trying to push through for breakthrough, God, that, that last bit that we allow to distract us in the very moments that your spirit is stirring us and we decide to check out, Lord, today we choose to check in, Lord. Would you just do a heart inventory of us, dear God, and in that place where we still have our hands around the lock, Father God, may we just open those hands up, God, and invite you and open that door because your word says that you stand at the door of our hearts and you knock, that we would allow you to enter. And so we invite you today, Lord. We say enter. We say enter, Lord. Would you do some things that only you could do in our heart, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As you're being seated, I want you to do something for me real quick. If you don't mind, could you look at somebody near you? You could pick anybody. You could pick the person to your left or to your right. Could you just look at them and say, no matter what? There you go. That was pretty easy. You want to do it again? Look at them one more time and just say, say, no matter what. Come on, balcony. Come on, balcony. There you go. Now look at a person on the other side that you just ignored. And uh, I want you to look at them and say, choose joy. Choose joy. There you go. There you go. See, look, they were just sitting there in their feelings because you looked the other direction. And you turned around and looked at them and they were all sour faced and you said, choose joy. You see, we're walking through it. She said, wow. <laughs> we're going through a journey through Philippians, right? Yeah, can you bring me that? Thank you so much. I forgot my cup. Appreciate it. Uh, love you. What are you doing at the church, girl? Oh, I'm sorry. 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 That's, that's my wife. That's holy. So I could, I could say that. Uh, I waited for that. Hallelujah. Anyway, okay. We're going through a study of Philippians. And, um, you know, you might have already picked up on the fact that this is a church where we absolutely celebrate joy. We love the Lord. We believe he's good. We believe he smiles at us. We believe the Lord has created laughter and humor and all those awesome things. But how many of y'all can agree that there are times in our life where, where when you are in a church that is so full of joy, sometimes you want to skip church because you ain't feeling joyful. Am I the only one who's ever been there? Because I know I've been there. If we're being brutally honest, I think we all hit those moments, right, where life is happening and we, and we get to church and we're like, oh, great, here come all the not just happy people. <laughs> We're arguing all the way to church. You know what? We're yelling at the kids. 
you know, the dog gets into it. I don't know, whatever. You get, you get to the parking lot. You're like, all right, we're here. Hi, God bless. How are you? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Brought my sword. I'm ready to divide the word. <laughs> Praise his holy name. We'll talk later. <laughs> this is my Bible? Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. But sometimes we, we feel like we have to fake it till we make it. What we're going through is a study of this book called Philippians. And the reason we're diving into this is because the Apostle Paul is, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to this little church. It's actually not a huge church. It's a church he started through the supernatural move of God. But he's writing back to this church while he is now in Roman prison. So years have passed since he started the church in Philippi. And he is writing them a letter. And as you guys know, we've been going through the New Testament as a church this year. So if you're new and you're just jumping in, don't worry. The New Testament isn't going anywhere. So you can go back and read it and catch up. Uh, the, the messages are archived. But we're taking a journey through the New Testament. And we've made our way to Philippians now. And the reason it's important is because in life, there are moments where we actually have to choose joy. And that happens for all of us. Now, I'm not talking about happiness. And what I think part of the problem that we have to attack is our culture has confused the emotion of happiness with the state of joy. What do I mean by that? Happiness is something that comes and goes, right? So I could be at the gym all happy because I think I got a good workout in, right? I'm feeling all excited. I've lost some weight. And I, and I feel like I got to go pump in my arms. And then I walk by and I see Jared over here on the curl machine being Jared. And I'm like, man, I got to go do another set. You know, like there went all my happiness. Like, man, I feel good. No, I don't. You ever get your hair cut and you're like excited and you did something new and you want to show your spouse and, you know, maybe, maybe ladies, you come in and you did a little something crazy. And, like, and your husband's like, oh, you cut your hair. Now, what he just said took all of that happiness that you, man, girl, you're Snapchatting to your friend, Instagramming about this new look, right? And your husband's, were all of a sudden, that whole, that's happiness. And it's like a balloon, pop, gone, pew. That's not what Paul's talking about. And I think one of the reasons we as the church in America, we struggle so much is because our culture has indoctrinated us with this idea that your happiness should be the compass of your life. Yes. Our culture, I mean, I, I call us the Burger King culture. Do you remember when Burger King started doing these commercials? Have it your way right away. And there's a reason that resonated with so many of us because that's what we've been taught, like, by all the advertising. But all, it's, it's all about you. It's all about me. It's about what makes me happy right now because I'm so happy. Right. <laughs> and everywhere we turn, if we're not careful, we don't realize we're getting inundated with this, this, this message of happiness. The irony of that is something Pastor uh, Brian alluded to a little bit ago in the message. The irony is that we are one of the most affluent cultures on earth right now. Did you know that? Like if you were to get a line of people from around the world, we would pretty much be at the front of that line as Americans. Now, now I'm not saying that so you should be shamed or you should feel guilty about that because God's the one who chose where I was going to be born, not me, right? And I don't, I don't take guilt in what God has decided. What I do realize is he put me at the front of the line for a reason because he trusts me to do something for the people at the back of the line. And so with this influence, if we're not careful, we start chasing the wrong thing. Paul is writing to the Philippians for a reason. Ph Philippi was a really incredible place. Actually had amazing history and it's important to the story. So we're going to get into Philippians. We're going to start in chapter 2. But I want to just share with you briefly why this mattered so much. And I'm wondering if we'll see parallel. You see, in the, book, in the letter that he writes, and there's two themes. And there's a couple of words that show up over and over and over. And they have to do with this idea of joy. The first is that Paul, in this letter from prison to the church in Philippi uses the word Christ 38 times. What's Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He keeps pointing them back to Jesus, the Christ, as the source. And look at the next word there, 16 times the word joy. Doesn't use the word happiness. He's talking about joy. To a culture who is actually pretty affluent. A culture that has a lot of stuff going on pretty good for itself. Let's go, if you were to write the word, uh, just kind of a one-sentence overview of what we're going to study for this month. Come to Jesus, the source of true joy. What does that mean? It means that when our paradigm of happiness fails us, there's still a source of true joy. 
That when we realize that everything our culture has thrown at us as what will satisfy us is still empty, that there is a source of true joy. This is the, 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 the culture that we find ourselves in. We are one of the most affluent, one of the most opulent, one of the most influential cultures in the world right now. And we have multi-million dollar celebrities who are taking their own lives in their penthouse apartment suites in Manhattan. Why? Because the reality is we have been sold a false philosophy. I often say, I heard that someone said, if you live your life for yourself, you will find yourself by yourself. Why are we studying this? Because Philippi was in a very similar situation. In fact, Philippi had a lot going for it. It was the, the site of a really epic war battle in the Roman Empire. Back in, I believe it was 40. Two, yeah, 42 B.C., if you study uh, military history, go check this out, the Battle of Philippi. Pretty fascinating thing took place in this town. This little town in Rome became pivotal because it was a place where Mark Anthony and Octavian got together to face Cassius and Brutus. And historically, Cassius and Brutus were the two guys who assassinated Julius Caesar, if you remember the, the story. Well, Mark Anthony and Octavius, who would later become Augustus Caesar, they actually defeated Cassius and Brutus at Philippi. So now it has this, like, this kind of this lore, this military lore of the culture of the Roman Empire, that this is the place where the battle was decided that made Rome switch from being a republic to an empire. Now, that's like the opposite of the Star Wars movies. In Star Wars, the Republic is trying to revolt against the Empire. Well, in, in history, uh, Mark Ant I'm sorry, Octavian became the first, like, Darth Vader. He became the first emperor of the Roman Empire because of the battle at Philippi. Why is that important? Because this was a special place to those in Roman culture. In the Roman military, officers and generals would often serve Caesar. They would serve uh, Augustus until retirement. And when they retired, they would go to this town called Philippi. And they would live out their life in opulence, affluence, and all the best things that life in Rome could offer as retired Roman generals in a city that was steeped in, in, in the empire's story. And they would be able to ride out their life with the influence of their, of their military career and the opulence that it afforded them. And they would spare themselves no good thing that the Roman Empire could provide. In that environment, in fact, it was so special that there was a decree, it was called a free city, which meant this, if you were a Roman citizen living in Philippi, you chose to live in Philippi, you didn't have to pay any taxes the rest of your life. Could you imagine if there was like a town, you know, like north of Gloucester somewhere, you know, like, hey, if you decide to move there, you never have to pay taxes again. Can we agree that that place might be flooded with, with, uh, with, <laughs> with people wanting to move? So when Paul is writing to this culture, this church in Philippi, he's writing to a people who are steeped in the history of the empire. Now, here's the problem with that. In the Roman Empire, Augustus was not just seen as the king. He was seen as a god. He was worshipped. And he was treated like a god. And Paul is writing us this letter. And he's saying, hey, all that focus on nationalistic pride, all that focus on opulence and influence, at the end of the day, that's not going to get you joy. In fact, if there were two idols in, the, in Philippi, it would be the idolatry of nationalism. That Rome is the greatest place on earth, and our emperor is the greatest being on earth. That, hey, to be a good citizen mean, means to be a good Roman and to, to, to experience the, the wealth and the influence of Rome. And because we are so great, like we rule and reign in comfort, the idolatry of comfort. I don't know, but this kind of reminds me of somewhere else. It kind of reminds me of a place where Christianity can get... Confused with nationalism. And if we're not careful, we begin telling ourselves the narrative that we are so great, Jesus must have come and died for the United States of America. And it's a slippery slope. My stepfather was a Marine for 30 years. I grew up on military bases. My wife is a vet. My brother's a vet. I love and honor the military, and I appreciate their role. And I know this. I love being an American. I'm grateful that I was born in what I consider to be one of the greatest nations in the history of the world. But I know this. I am first a citizen of the kingdom of God. 
first. And so Paul's writing this church, and I want to jump into that with the context that he's, he's really up against some really big challenges. Because they're struggling to understand a Christianity that goes beyond everything they've understood. And if we're not careful, we will do the same thing. And if we don't realize it, we will give ourselves to a false Christianity that tells us Christianity is about our king serving us. And so Paul's saying, that doesn't work too good. And he does this awesome thing. Anybody like poetry? Like when I was in school, I liked poetry. Like I watched the movie The Outsiders when I was a kid. And I remember they had that poem in there by Robert Frost. Remember, nothing gold could stay. Remember that? Anybody remember what I'm talking about? Nature's first green is gold. Her heart is hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. Dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. Stay gold, pointy boy, Curtis. Stay gold. <laughs> right? I memorized that poem, and I recited it to more than one sixth grade girl. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Didn't work. Don't worry, baby. It's paid for by the cross. <laughs> but I, I never really was much of a poet. Paul, if you don't know this, takes the heart of Philippians to write a poem about God. And so I want to start, we're not going to go verse by verse like we've been doing. We're going to actually jump to chapter 2 of Philippians. And I would love for us to dive into this beautiful poem that he wrote for our Savior. Can we do that? Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1, and then we're going to get to this poem. If you have your Bibles, you can flip there. If it glows, go ahead and open the app and get there. My Bible is old school. It does not run out of batteries. Praise God. I don't care how you read it. Just read it. Here we go. Therefore, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, any comfort in his love, any common sharing in his spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of self-ambition. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And now he begins to write this beautiful poem about the king of our kingdom to the people who understand what an emperor is, but not what a servant king is. Check this out. It says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's his poem. That's his offering. He's saying, if you want to understand the kingdom, let me explain to you our king. Our king is so different. But before he even does that, he's like, if you want to understand joy, let me, let me break it down for you. And I have a little cheesy acronym here that, that I kind of threw together. Actually, I found it somewhere. But um, this is the, the, the equation that Paul gives us in Philippians 2, 1 through 4 for joy. Are you ready? Everybody just look at somebody and say, joy. joy. There you go. Now say it like you mean it. Smile. Joy. This is the order that Paul just gave us. Look at the first one is what? Jesus. Jesus first. Now we all, yeah, I mean, it's easy for me as a preacher. It's for me, for me as a dad, as a pastor. Oh, yeah, keep Jesus first. It's easy to say that at church. It's hard to say that in traffic. It's easy to say that in the preseason. It's hard to say that when your star rookie quarterback tears his ACL. <laughs> Ruining your fantasy football team. But Jesus, keeping him first in all things, right? Joy comes by keeping Jesus first and then what? Who comes next? Others. Who, who considered others. Paul says, don't think of yourselves first. Instead, in humility, consider others before why, which is what? Yourself. You. J-O-Y-U. This is the order. 
This is the only order that will disrupt the cycle of chasing, un- like the unending chase of happiness in a moment. What God is saying is, let me interrupt that cycle that will just spin you into darker places over and over, trying to chase this addictive drug called happiness. And instead, let's just live a lifestyle where no matter what, I can choose joy. I can choose Jesus first, others second, and myself last. And he doesn't stop there. He says, let's look at our servant king. Let's look at not just the recipe, but let's look at the example. So he goes into this uh, four things Paul's poem teaches us about Jesus. Four things. First, he tells us he, t- he thinks of others, not himself. Then he says, our king, our ruler, he serves. He sacrifices. And he does all this thing for one reason, which is the glory of God the Father. And he says, if we're going to understand the kingdom, we have to first understand our king. Our king is not an emperor who rules and reigns through fear and intimidation. He is a servant who steps into humanity for the lost and the least. So let's go to this first thing. He thinks of others, not himself. He thinks of others, not himself. As we read in verse 6, let's go back to verse 6. Who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Has anybody seen the movie Bruce Almighty? Like where, where God gives this guy, played by Jim Carrey, all his power. What's the first thing he does? He's like, traffic? I don't want traffic. <sighs> now, I'm not going to lie to you. If I ever had that kind of authority, and I'm at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. Okay, I'm just, I praise God that, that that's not reality. There'd be some people, people late to work. I don't know what happened. My car just got shoved to the side, and some sports car came zipping through, some Tesla, and nobody was even driving. Anyway, so. But look at what the posture of our Savior is. He, he being God, says, yeah, you know what? Let me, let me step out of my, my, my heavenly realm and step into the dirt of humanity because there's a bigger mission at hand. And we have this philosophy warring against us. Why? Because we have a very real enemy. Did you know the Bible is pretty clear? We talked about it in worship. John 10.10, 10, the thief, the devil, the enemy, the adversary, the evil one comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why he's here. And Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance, have it in fullness, right? We have a very real enemy who from day zero has been trying to defile us created in the image of God and trying to thwart God's purpose for his kingdom on earth. Since day one, since Adam and Eve, go look at it. Like from the very beginning, he's against the move of God. Why? Well, it's really interesting when you do a study of Satan or Lucifer in the Old Testament, there's some prophecies that describe him, that allude to him. And what we learn about him uh, in Ezekiel, for example, we learn that like he was this mighty, mighty angel that God created. And he covered him in all these beautiful jewels. And he actually was in, 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 in heavens. And, and he was there besides the throne of God. He was a mighty being. That's how he started. But he had something inside of him that was not okay with being the created one. He wanted to be like the creator. He had something in him that, that has his own will set against the will of God. And because of that, the Bible tells us he was cast down. He lost his place. And since then, he has been trying to set, uh, just set his influence in God's kids to settle for a philosophy of this world that is against the very philosophy of the kingdom. Let's read in Isaiah what Isaiah says about this, this, this adversary. Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once lay low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Stars is a word for angels, by the way. I will, go ahead, let's go to the next one. I will sit enthroned on the mountain of the assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like who? The Most High. El Elyon is the Hebrew word used right there. I'm going to tell you that in a second. Hold on. But you are brought down to the realm of of the dead, to the 
depths of the pit. You know what I love about this? That word I, it, where Satan is staring in the heavenly place. Isaiah is getting a picture of what happened centuries before. And he's saying, man, he wanted to be like the Most High God. It's a Hebrew title. That's why it's uh, capitalized. The word Most High is El Elyon. And which is interesting, it means God Most High, the Most High God. This is in the Old Testament. Isaiah is getting a picture of what, what was going on in the heavenly place way back when Satan rebelled against God before even Adam and Eve. Now check this out. Fast forward all the way to the New Testament, and I want you to do a study. I want you to go through the ministry of Jesus every time he has an interaction with a demon-possessed person. Who The demons are, are those who fell with Satan, right? They, they were part of his uprising. They all got cast down here. And every time Jesus is interacting with someone who's demon-possessed, and they try to refer to him, do you know what they call him? The Most High God. I find it fascinating that our king is so powerful, even his enemies have to give him respect. Every single time a demon possessed person sees Jesus and wants to interact with them, and they start to call him out, they're like, you are El Elyon, son of the most high God. I like it because it sounds Spanish, El Elyon. You know, that's my people. But it's not Spanish, it's Hebrew. But anyway. You are not going to find anywhere in the New Testament where a demon can refer to Jesus as anything other than, hey, guess what? Every time I address you, I have to address the fact that you were right, we were wrong, and you're higher than we are. I love that. I love it. But look at Lucifer. Lucifer, uh, his philosophy, he said, I will. I will ascend above the heavens. I will. Jesus showed up and said, thy will. Not my will, but thy will be done. Our king said, thy will. The king of this philosophy of this world said, I will. I don't know about you, but how's that working out? <laughs> Lucifer was satis not satisfied to be a creature. He wanted to be like the creator. Jesus was the creator, and he stepped into humanity as the created being so that he could solidify these things. So as we understand our king, we have to understand his posture. And if you want to go any further, just look at the results. And we can look at those today. Let's keep going. Our king is a king who serves. He serves. Our king didn't show up to say, here I am. <laughs> right? He came and said, how can I help you? Jesus spent his time with the lost and the least. Jesus recruited his own church. Jesus picked 12 guys and said, hey, listen, I want to build into you. Right now, your life is about this, but I'm going to make it about so much more. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And even the 12 he picked, one of them betrayed him. Judas decided, I'm going to betray him, right? But he still loved him, and he still invited him to the same table. He serves. He modeled a kingdom where the king comes to serve everyone else. I find it fascinating if you've ever studied the Last Supper. We talk about it sometimes when we do communion. Have you ever read through the Last Supper narratives about Jesus? It's on a Thursday night. They're celebrating a Passover meal. It's the night he's going to be betrayed and arrested by Judas. They've gathered together to celebrate Seder meal, and they are there at the table. And the Bible has different narratives that tell us the same story. But there's one really fascinating one to me. And it's in the Gospel of John. And I'm not sure exactly why or how this is written, but I know it's there for a reason. As we think about the posture of a king who serves, let's go to John 13. I don't know if you've ever read this or noticed this. But this has become for me a challenge for ministry. A challenge for how I steward the influence that God gives me. And trust me with. A challenge for how I posture my life, I hope, in regards to the opportunities the Lord has blessed me with. I want you to read this. They're at the dinner table. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, check this out. This verse right here, it's only in John's narrative that it tells us this. And I find it fascinating. Jesus, so they're at dinner. And John wants us to know something about Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Everybody say power. power. See, that's a word that we're not comfortable with, right? 
Jesus knew at that dinner, whether he knew before or not, we don't know, but we know this. We know that John wants us to know that as they were at the dinner table, Jesus understood that the Father had put all things under his power. The Father had says, said, what, whatever you desire to take place on earth is going to happen. I am giving you the keys to the kingdom. What happens next is completely up to your authority because I trust you that much, son. And it tells us Jesus knew that in that moment and that he had come from God. He was returning to God. And so there's this moment and there's this little word so, and I'm going to leave it right here for me. There's this little word so. And that little word means that whatever is coming next is happening because of what just happened, right? And what just happened was John says Jesus in that moment understood that he was the most powerful entity to ever cross the horizon of human existence. Think about that for a second. He sat at the table with his betrayer, knowing he was going to betray him. What would you do with that power? Oh, you must not know about me. <laughs> to the left, to the left. <laughs> what would you do? Power. What do you do with it? What does the king of kings do with power? What do you do when your next words determine the life of somebody else? Parents, I don't know if you realize how true that is for us with our children. Husbands with our wives. Wives with our husbands. What do you do? Power. And the Bible gives us this little word, so. Jesus, knowing that he was all-powerful, the king of kings, not, not this little emperor of Rome, but the one who would reign forever on the throne of David, the one who would be killed and rise from the dead, the one who death could not stop, he knew right then at dinner that he was that powerful. So, let's read what he did. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What do you do with the authority God gives you? You use it to serve somebody else. <laughs> the king, the king, the most powerful entity in all of humanity did the job that the lowest, lowliest of the servants was supposed to do. He, these guys walked around in open-toed sandals. They shared roads with animals. There was dirt everywhere and sweat. This was not a job anyone would sign up for except for the king of our kingdom. And he did it the moment he knew the father had given him all authority. He said, okay, I'm going to use it to serve in the, the lowliest way possible. And he washed their feet. Who has God positioned you with authority and influence over so that you could help wash the nastiest parts of their life off? That's the kingdom that we are in. And I love this picture of our king, but it doesn't stop there. The poem continues. He sacrifices. Philippians 2 verse 8. He sacrifices. It says, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why did Paul write that to the Philippians, the even death on a cross? Because they were a part of the Roman Empire, and they would understand something about those words, even death on a cross. You see, the cross wasn't just like, oh, you know, you got in trouble, cool. The cross wasn't even just, okay, you get the lethal injection, you know. The cross was a particular way of carrying out capital punishment that humiliated, belittled, and publicly embarrassed and shamed the person who was being crucified. It was reserved for the worst of the worst. To see someone hanging on a cross in the time of Jesus in the Roman Empire, you would immediately assume they were like at the bottom of the dungeon. They were despicable human beings. They were not just an offender. They were the worst offender. They were so bad that they were even crucified. They were even killed in a way that's different than the rest of the prisoners who get killed. Like they wanted to make sure that everyone knew you want to spend your life, kids, and avoid being that guy. Even death on a cross. That's our king. That's our king ascending to his kingdom for you and I. 
I used to work at a Christian bookstore years ago. And when I did, I remember we would have this clearance sale table in this clearance sale area. And I remember often there were times where people would come in. They would be looking for, like, uh, you know, good sales and good deals. Especially Christian bookstores because, man, it's crazy in there. You know what I'm saying? The price. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> just saying. That's like. Like, people are like, well, Walmart. I'm like, yeah, Walmart sells 58 million of these Bibles. We only sell like 30. So we got, you know, it's a different price. Sorry. Uh, but we always had this clearance sale table. And it always stuck out to me when we would have crosses, decorative crosses on the clearance sale table. And people come in, buy them. I never judge them. Never, but, you know, something stood out to me about that. And, I, and, and to this day, I, I, I hope that that never becomes a metaphor for my life, that I want a cross, but I want a cheap one. Yeah, you see, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. And I believe, if I'm talking about myself and sacrifice, that I think we all want to sacrifice until it costs us something, right? That's when it becomes a choice. I mean, sacrifice that doesn't cost, that's easy, right? But when it costs, even death on a cross, that's the kingdom that we're a part of. That, 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 that a sacrifice that doesn't cost, in fact, there was a guy named Dr. J.H. Jowett, and he said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Why? Because the kingdom that we're invited into is an invitation to surrender ourselves for somebody else. I was talking to Pastor Courtney about this message, and he said, good times don't require much God strength, but tough times are where we meet God in new ways. Pastor Courtney's our lead pastor in San Antonio. He's got so much wisdom. And we're thinking about this. And have you ever considered the fact that when Jesus rose from the dead, he kept his scars? Like, have you ever thought about that? Like, you remember, like, he shows up to the disciples and they're like, is it really you? Because he's got this new body, which is awesome. Like, he can be, like, unrecognizable when he wants to on the road to Emmaus. And then he can reveal himself when he wants to. And they're like, oh, it's Jesus. Wow. Like, you did this thing with your face. You know, like. They're in, in a locked room, and he kind of walks through the wall like Neo, you know, like, phew. and like, it's a ghost. He's like, no, guys, calm down. It's just me and my resurrected body. It's cool. But then Thomas is like, Lord, if, how do we know it's you? That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas. I mean, come on. If you had been through what he'd been through, wouldn't you be like, it's a hologram? What's going on here? And he goes, put your hands in the holes. Hey, Thomas, really, go ahead. Touch the hole in my side where I was pierced for, for you guys. Think about that for a second. Because when I get my resurrected body, the Bible tells me that when we get to heaven, we're going to have a resurrected body. And I know a couple things. One, I'm going to be able to sing better than anybody on this worship stage. Because I waited. I sing horribly now. So I believe in God that I'm, I'm going to be up there like hitting all these notes they can't hit. And be like, it's cool. I'll teach you later. But I know this too, I ain't going to have stretch marks on my love handles in heaven. <laughs> no, I'm serious. If I do, I'm going to go to, hey, like, can we fix this? Where's the heavenly, like, <laughs> where's the heavenly surgical center? Go, we're, we're just going to clean that right up. Come on. Scars. Usually, we don't show off our scars. You see, we have a king who says, I kept these as evidence. I kept these so you would never forget what I paid for you. I kept these because I'm not ashamed of these. These are what are evidence that I have the right to offer you this love. You want to know when you're healed in the kingdom? When you stop trying to hide your scars and you start pointing to them, say, hey, let me show you this scar in my heart that Jesus brought me out of. I'm not ashamed of that. I got another one right here in my past. Let me show you because my Savior took care of it. And I don't got to hide the past anymore. It used to be shameful, but he stepped into it. Now it's evidence that he delivered me from something. Scars. And if that was not enough, we get to this thing here that he glorifies God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Everything that Jesus did comes down to this. Therefore God exalted him... A, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and right here and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord last sentence is the most important one of the poem I believe to the glory of God the Father Jesus lived his life in total obedience for that last sentence for the glory of God the Father do you want to understand how to choose joy no matter what 
Let it start with the glory of God and end with what's going on with me. Often, when I am in the worst parts of my life, when I'm the most miserable, the most down, the most frustrated, it's because I'm starting with what's going on with me, and my last thought is the glory of God. But maybe if I made the choice to rejoice, I might see a different shift. Because it is a choice. It's a choice to go from what was me to praise him. You know, the irony of all this is Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. He's writing them a letter from prison, and he's not like, hey, let me write a poem for you. Please send me commissary. <laughs> he's saying, it doesn't matter what's going on in your circumstances, you can choose to rejoice. You know how he knew that? Because he's writing to a church that he started when he was in prison in Philippi. Go back to Acts. We don't have time today, but I want you to, I got homework for you. You're like, oh, great. <laughs> Acts 16 is the birth of the church that Paul is writing in Philippians. And you know how it started? Paul and Silas get arrested for preaching the gospel in Philippi. They've cast a demon out of a demon-possessed girl who was fortune-telling and making money for somebody. And the people got mad because now they ain't, they're not going to get that money. So they stir up the crowd against Paul and Silas. They get beat up. They get stripped. They get thrown in a jail cell in Philippi, and they get stockades put on their ankles. And they, all that happened to them because they're being obedient to Jesus. And as they are in prison, Acts 16 tells us that they didn't sit there, oh, God, where are you when I need you, God? I was just doing what you told me to do, God. No, but what was me? That's the soundtrack of my life sometimes. That's all. I'm just, you know, like, come on, God. This is hard. He's like, go read, Paul. Dang. I'm a cupcake. A marshmallow, you know. You know what they did? They worshiped. There they are, laying in prison, beaten up and bloody. For the Lord is good and his love endures. I told you my voice is coming to heaven. But I'll still worship him. For the Lord is good forever. And I'll shout it out. Can you imagine what the other prisoners, hey man, I'm trying to sleep. Quit all that racket. For the Lord is good. What's wrong with y'all? You are beaten, bloody, and naked. What is going on with you? And his love endures. And we're just choosing to rejoice. We're going to praise ourselves through this. Yeah, we can whine about everything that went wrong, or we can celebrate about the best thing going on in our life. And your love endures forever. And you know what the Bible tells us? Acts 16, it says that at midnight, the jail began to shake. And there was an earthquake. And the doors came flying open. And those stockades fell right off their feet. And the guy in charge, the jailer, was about to kill himself because he knew the punishment of the prisoners getting set free. He would be tortured and killed. So as he grabs his sword, because the empire he had built his philosophy of life on could not answer the kingdom invading earth, he starts to end his life. And Paul says, wait, we're all here. And the jailer in Philippi says, sir, what must I do to be saved? And that night, he and his household were saved and were baptized. And now Paul is writing a letter to a church that started in a moment where they celebrated themselves out of a prison. Yeah. I'm just wondering, if we made the choice to rejoice, what prison doors in our emotional, spiritual, and mental life are waiting to get thrown open this morning? I'm just wondering if there's anybody in here who is one praise away from the person next to you in your life getting their prison door set free. You see, they weren't the only ones set free. Everyone was set free because of the choice to rejoice. I am convinced we have a culture, a world begging and dying and looking for some people who will stand up in spite of anything and say, I will choose no matter what, joy. And then we'll see kingdom breakthrough. Let's do that right now. Let's stand up. Come on. Let's stand together. Stand up. Look at somebody and say, we're about to make a choice to rejoice. Come on. 
I want you to take this as a royal, uh, you are royalty in the kingdom, and I want to just issue you a royalty challenge. Are you ready? This is your challenge. Right now, don't let this be about us singing a song before church is over. Right now, in fact, close your eyes if you don't mind. Just right now, I want you to think about the emotional, the mental, the spiritual prison you might be dealing with, the stockades that are around your legs that no one else in this room sees right now. And would you imagine what life could look like if instead of focusing on those, you focused on the Lord and his goodness and his love enduring forever. And maybe for you, it's not about you. It's about the person that you know is near you, and you're going to sing till their prison door starts getting shook. Till their shackles start getting shifted. Father, right now in Jesus' name, as we make it our purpose to bring declaration to your name, I pray that we would be a people who choose to rejoice no matter what. That we would break the cycle and the bondage that brought us here and we would allow heaven to invade earth. I pray in Jesus' name, addiction fall off right now in Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, depression and oppression, Lord God, that they get broken free. I pray right now for the person who realizes they have spent all their time talking to you about what's wrong and they're deciding right now to talking to you about how right you are, that they would just have a shift of atmosphere, a shift of perspective, and a shift of experience right now as we choose to rejoice in Jesus' name. Come on. The Lord is good. Let's do it. Come on. For the Lord is good and his love endures. Yes, the Lord is good forever. And I'll shout it out from the mountain. Yes, the Lord is good. Come on, can we sing that together? Sing for the Lord. For the Lord is good. You got it. And his love endures. Yes, the Lord is good forever. And I'll shout it out from the mountain. Come on and say, yes, the Lord. want and all we need is found in Jesus. Oh, we ask it's more of you. Is that anybody's prayer today? If it's your prayer, can you lift your hands and sing that too? Nothing else can satisfy our heart's desire oh we ask it's more of you come on let's lift our hands and our voices together
you say And we are not ashamed to shout it out. Hey, from the yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord. Come on, one more time, no music. Say for the Lord, for the Lord. And what you gonna do? 